be it should be described as the taking uh, into account that really reality is like that but this is another metaphysics so if you recognize that uh, the history of, of modern and postmodern civilization as this weakening direction moral choices can be guided by a sort of uh, attitude to reduct aggressivity to reduce aggressivity to to be more friendly to nature and so on as, as i told before uh, it is a sort of Schopenhauerian ethics which is related in my opinion to weak thought I think it's not accidental that postmodern theory and cultural studies both emerged in the 1980s as widespread models for the analysis of popular culture. It's precisely the proliferation of forms of popular culture, of the images of popular culture, the increased popularity of film, of popular music, of uh, television, of any number of forms of culture in the 1980s that the postmodernists have been describing that makes it imperative to study academically and to valorize politically these different forms of culture. There has also been, and this is another postmodern point, an erosion of the distinction between high and low culture, so-called, in the academy, that English departments are no longer just teaching English and the canon and the great works, but are also looking at alternative, marginal literatures, excluded voices, different types of oppositional literature and text, and the forms of popular culture. Now, cultural studies, as it, as it developed in England in the Birmingham School, made this broad range of popular culture the terrain of study. From the beginning, they attacked the distinction between high and low culture. They valorized the importance of popular culture in people's lives and for left political uh, projects in the way that I discussed um, earlier. Moreover, they gave critical methods of analyzing popular culture, ideology critique, Freudian uh, symbol criticism, feminism as a perspective and critical method for analyzing uh, popular culture that are of extreme importance today. So cultural studies, both as sort of a project of study as it developed in uh, England, uh, as a methodology to criticize and analyze popular culture, and popular cult, um, cultural studies as a political project involved with critiques and analyses of the hegemonic, the dominant forms of culture in a society that also studied the marginal subcultures, the cultures of resistance that would form the possibility of what Gramsci called a counter-hegemony, strikes me also as an extremely important political intervention within the uh, field of the study of uh, popular uh, culture. What passes as cultural studies in the United States of America, I find um, extraordinary. I mean, you know, it's not anything that I recognize. You know, it has no sense, a lot of it has no sense of history. It has very little sociological input. Uh, it's very rarely empirically based. I mean, th this sort of, the designation, you know, th this term cultural studies and who's going to kind of own it, as it were, seems to be a sort of an issue, and clearly an important issue for people. And, you know, in all kinds of ways, intellectually, in terms of career prospects. There are many things at stake for many people, but uh, this animal uh, cultural studies and the particular kind of um, transformation it seems to have undergone uh, certainly in, 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 in the passage of some part of it between Britain and the USA is very curious. And I suppose, you know, I spent some years um, in the mid-80s, only partially involved in academic works. I was actually mm, running a publishing house most of the time. And in publishing terms, what's extremely interesting is that, like, as of course, is that theory, very abstract theory, is the most exportable product, yeah? The publishing I was interested in doing with the original Comedialist was very interventionist and very locally focused. We wanted to publish things that would make a difference to what happened in Britain. We had the kind of, at one point, I mean, it was a bit mad. At one point, we had the production schedule for books down to 12 weeks. 
and we're producing things that, you know, a year later in another country, you know, were useless. You know, it was very much publication for use. And maybe that was a kind of utopian project in a sense. But I suppose what I find really striking is the extent to which the kind of high theoretical redefinition of cultural studies really has to be seen to some extent as an effect of the economic logic of the publishing industry, which will always push you towards abstraction because you've got a bigger market. Travel's better. Theory is export industry. This summer at the ICA conference in Dublin, in, there was a kind of debate in which I, somebody put me on the spot kind of publicly to define the difference between uh, British cultural studies and American cultural studies. Now, I, had, I, never, I had never really thought about that question. I'm not even sure it's a very interesting question. But as I was asked it, I said, well, I think it's the difference between Foucault read through Gramsci and Gramsci read through Foucault. And that's a kind of glib answer in one way, but it's also a serious answer. And, but again, that's a real wisdom of hindsight thing. My abiding memory is of Stuart coming into uh, uh, seminar rooms, like with these piles of books that he, you know, put down to start working from, you know. And yes, there was Palancis, yes, there was Althusser, yes, there was Gramsci, but there was so much material going into that part at that time. I mean, you know, at the same time, that there are, there are whole trajectories which were actually very important to us at the, at the, in formulating that project, which are very, very little referred to these days. I mean, actually, for instance, Durkheim and Mauss's primitive classification played a key role at a certain point when Stuart was trying to think through the argument that he uses in deviancy politics in the media, that notion about an agenda-setting model and how you understand media and classification. We were reading Clifford Geertz. You know, we'd begun with the material which is also the kind of sociological critique of Bernstein, which is the kind of Rosen connection. We've met Charles Wolfson, who'd actually introduced all of us to Voloshinov at that point, which was a kind of a slow influence, one that retrospectively is, is of, clearly of enormous significance. But at the time, it was just, you know, one seminar where this guy said some very interesting things about this linguist called Voloshinov, who we thought maybe we'd follow up on, you know. That, you know there, was an there was an interest in the... The ethnomethodological tradition, you know, we're actually reading Garfinkel and Sachs and the rest of it, trying to think about how you could use that within a kind of broader frame of political analysis. So when you want to talk about media presentations as work or ideological labor, you know, that stuff is interesting. So, you know, yes, Althusser, you know, we all spent a long time banging our heads against Althusser and then Palancis and so on and so forth. And Gramsci was there, th you know, as, as a kind of influence throughout. But I, I think kind of just to pick out those threads, um, it's, t it's, too, um, it's, too, it's too simple a story. There was actually a whole lot of other stuff going into the pot. Doug, your work derives mainly from the Frankfurt School, at least it comes out of that tradition. Uh, what elements of their thinking do you find exciting and useful today? Well, the Frankfurt School was really the first group of theorists that discovered the importance of mass culture and mass communications. That in the U.S. and the advanced capitalist countries, but also the communist world and fascist Germany that they were refugees from, mass culture is becoming an important form of social integration, that things like films and comic books and broadcasting were vehicles of ideology. And in their classic study of the culture industries and dialectic of enlightenment, Adorno and Horkheimer were the first to show that social theory, to conceptualize how society works, needs to have a theory of mass culture and mass communications. Moreover, that this has political ramifications. They were concerned with the integration of the working class in advanced capitalist societies and how it was that the proletariat, which was supposed to be the revolutionary, most progressive force in society in the classical Marxist theory, had been integrated into a conservative social force. And mass culture was one of the explanations for that, that people were deceived, indoctrinated, mystified by mass culture, that mass culture was a form of ideology that served the interests of the ruling class and was thus a new mode of social control. So that was the starting point for my work in popular culture. And I still think today that they're right that mass culture is an important component of contemporary capitalist societies, 
that to understand the organization of our societies, we need to understand the role of mass culture and mass communication. Where I came to disagree with them, and I think I was influenced here by the British cultural studies tradition, was this notion that mass culture was a, uni, uni, a monolithic uh, form of domination and ideology, that there was, it was a one-dimensional form in which it was totally a vehicle for conservative ideology. Following the approach of the cultural studies tradition that was influenced by the Italian theory, theorist Antonio Gramsci, they developed a hegemony force, a hegemony model of popular culture, that each society is a sort of matrix of conflicting groups and forces and subcultures, that the ruling class, for instance, is divided into class sectors. Sometimes a conservative sector, sometimes a liberal sector, becomes the hegemonic, the dominant force in the society, but it is always battling opposing forces that there are new social movements, that there are oppositional groups, there's individuals fighting for a counter-hegemony, be it socialists or feminists or black or brown liberationists, that society is a matrix of struggle. And in this way, I move to the position that popular culture itself is a contested terrain. At one level, popular culture is necessarily made out of the products of various industries. Uh, we're talking about the cultural industries in particular, television, film, music, and so on, but out of uh, the clothing industry, the car industry. Uh, so all industrial products can be taken into popular culture. But that doesn't mean to say that commodities that are produced and distributed by uh, capitalist industries, the mass culture industries, are therefore synonymous with popular culture. At the, for the start, there's an enormous popular discrimination at work. Um, 12 out of 13 pop records fail to make a profit. 8 out of 10 movies fail to recover their production costs at the box office anyway. They'll pick them up on video later. 4 out of 5 primetime television programs don't make it to the end of their first season. And the industry doesn't know which of the ones are going to be taken up and made into popular culture, otherwise it wouldn't produce the rest, you know. So it has to produce this repertoire, from which, out of which the various formations of the people make popular culture. So what is often thought of and described as mass culture is, if you like, the industrialized end of the process that produces cultural resources. The, some of these are then taken up reworked, recycled, reproduced by the people, and that is popular culture. So it, it is a crucial distinction to make. Semiotics is not the study of science. Well, in the same way in which linguistics is not the, st the study of words. And linguistics is the study of the way in which we, we speak. <laughs> and semiotics is a, an attempt to study forms, organization, and process of signification. The way in which we organize and the way in which we process the signification. The difference is crucial. Why I start from the pro general process of signification and not from science. There are two fundamental reasons. They are theoretical too, but very practical too. Suppose that you have different kind of words and you put words together. Are you producing a text? Not at all. <laughs> the fact that you, you produce text, you know what we, we mean, but we don't know how you mean what we mean. What semiotics is trying to do is to add some level of intelligibility